welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Our show for you this month is about Earth's only natural satellite, the Moon. And here with me in the studio to talk about the Moon is John Schroer. John, good to be back with you again. It's nice to be here, Don. Thank you very much. Now, I think this is the first time we've really done a whole show devoted to just the Moon outside of the What's Up segment. Yeah, that's correct. Um, the moon is the first thing that people notice in the sky at night, uh, going back thousands and thousands of years. People have imagined the moon being a goddess. They've imagined the moon being um, a god. They've, they've, when they look at the moon, some people, when they're using just their eyes, think they see a woman in the moon or a rabbit in the moon or even a frog for that matter. Now, I understand our first video shows uh, some features on the moon. Well, the first picture we're going to show you, it won't be a video as such, the first picture will show you the moon with some of the names. Now, when Galileo first looked at the moon through a telescope, he thought these large dark areas that you're seeing on the screen were seas, using the Latin word mare, such as mare tranquillitatis, which is the sea of tranquility, where Neil and Buzz landed back in 1969. And there are also prominent craters that you can see just using your eye. That includes ones like Tycho and, uh, and Copernicus. All right, so these, these features can be seen just using your unaided eye, and uh, I suppose if you took out a pair of binoculars, you'd be able to see a bit more? Yes, you would. Now, the one thing that, that people, and it's actually a school requirement nowadays, is getting straight why the moon goes through phases. And so what we have for you is a little song uh, called Phases of the Moon that will uh, help you learn the different phases of the moon and why it happens. Moon. New moon waxing, crescent, first quarter waxing gibbous. Phases of the moon. Full moon winding gibbous, last quarter winding crescent. Phases of the moon. New moon waxing, crescent, first quarter waxing gibbous. Phases of the moon. Full moon winding gibbous, last quarter winding crescent. When the moon is in the same direction of the sun, it's called the new, new moon. moon. New moon. When you don't see no light coming from the moon, it is a dark moon called the new moon. A crescent moon is in the next, next stage when the moon is lit a quarter of the way. way. Less than half but more than zero. Ooh. This is called the crescent moon. True. Now a quarter moon's a half moon. You see a half moon's a quarter moon. Quarter moon's a half moon. They call a half moon a quarter moon what? because it made a quarter of its turn around the earth. You see half of the moon lit up, and I know what you're thinking, but it's a half moon called the quarter moon. That was really cute, John. I'm glad we were able to uh, bring that to our viewers. Now for our next video, uh, what do you have for us? Well, the next video is going to show you if you were looking at the moon and nothing else for an entire month, you would see how the light from the sun falling on the moon gives us the phases in one continuous clip. So let's go ahead and roll that and look at the moon going through its phases. That was a very interesting video, John. Now, next up, we have uh, an image showing us the various landing sites of the uh, U.S. Uh, moon mission, correct? That's correct. One thing that people remember, at least I remember visually because I was alive during the time, is where Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17 missions landed on the moon. Here you'll see the various locations that varied from the very safe easy to get to Apollo 11 site, which was, was in the Sea and Tranquility, all the way up to the most challenging landing site, which was the Taurus Litro Valley. And that's where Gene Cernan and the only scientist to go to the moon, Harrison Smith, the geologist, landed 
uh, way back in 19, uh, 1972, the last of the missions. So that was 40 years ago. That was 40 years ago. That's absolutely correct. Now, a, a question that many people have is, well, how did the moon get to look like what it is today? So what we'd like to do is uh, show you a video clip that will uh, actually show you, um, thanks to the people of the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the newest mission to the moon, um, how the moon got to be that way, starting when it first formed about four and a half billion years ago until today. So let's take a look at that and look at the evolution of the moon. You can see that the solar system during the very early days was a pretty dangerous place. Now imagine if the moon got hit that hard, well the same thing happened to us because we're only 240,000 miles away from the moon. Of course that's what it is today. In its earlier days the moon was 15 times larger in our night sky. And that's back when the earth spun around once every four hours. So it was a pretty crazy place back in the old days. Must have been quite a sight to see a full moon over the horizon. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it would have been like a nightmare. Now, what do we got next here, John? Well, the next video is uh, we wanted to show a little closer view of the moon. And the first clip we're going to show you is from Kaiguya. It's the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency's mission to the moon. Um, and they had on board an experiment, a high-definition TV camera. So this is going to take you over the Sea of Tranquility, Mare uh, Serenitatis, over the crater Plinius, and then to where Neil and Buzz walked 43 years ago, over the Sea of Tranquility. So let's take a look at that. Its terrain is very flat, but covered in wrinkle ridges that can be seen in this video. This is the landing site of Apollo 11, where on July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human being to step onto the surface of the moon. Thanks for those interesting videos, John. If any of you have any questions about this show, or any other for that matter, you can send your question in an email form to us here at Astronomy for Everyone. You can see the email address down at the bottom of your screen. And right after term of the month, we'll be back with more interesting facts, videos, and images of the moon. Stay tuned. The term of the month for July 2012 is neutrino. Neutrinos are small particles. They don't have much mass, but they have some, and they're produced in atomic reactions, some in the sun, and certainly in the supernova explosions. Now, a couple months ago, we had, as the term of the month, we had SN1987A, and this was a supernova explosion that happened in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It was the closest supernova explosion since the invention of the telescope. It was a type 2p 
um, a supernova, and the progenitor star was a blue supergiant star. This was a real surprise to scientists at the time because it was thought at the time that blue supergiants couldn't, in fact, explode. When it exploded, it produced 10 to the 58, that's a 1 with 58 zeros, neutrinos, and it turns out they were, there were some neutrinos that were detected on Earth about three hours before the visible light of the supernova was detected. Now, the observatory, the observatories that detected it, one was Kamiokine 2 in Japan, and one was uh, in the U.S., and one was in the then USSR, they detected a total of 24 neutrinos. And they detected them in a burst of about 13 seconds. Now, most of the neutrinos didn't head toward the Earth at all, and then the ones that headed toward the Earth, most of them didn't hit the detectors, and the ones that hit the detectors mostly weren't detected. So, and that's because neutrinos can go through the Earth without really much interaction of any kind, other than maybe a little deflection by gravity. Now, the neutrinos were detected three hours early, not because they moved faster than light, but because they were able to exit the blue supergiant star before visible light was able to. The visible light had to wait until the star broke apart in the explosion. The neutrinos mostly could make it through much of the star earlier. And that's the term of the month for July 2012, Neutrino. Welcome back to our show. The program this month is on the Moon, Earth's only natural satellite. And here's a quick question for you. Of the first three planets away from the Sun, which is the first one to have a natural satellite? Well, of course, the answer is Earth with the Moon. We're back here in the studio with John Schwar to continue on our discovery. And John, what do you have next for us? Well, one thing that people don't realize is that the Earth is not only the first planet out from the sun to have a moon, that our moon is much larger in relation to its parent body than any other moon in the solar system, with the possible exception of Pluto, which we all know is no longer a planet, but a dwarf planet, or a plutoid. So, um, the next thing we want to talk about, since this is the July show, is we're going to talk about Apollo 11. And it is now the 43rd anniversary coming up this month for Neil and Buzz, uh, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, uh, Buzz Aldrin, Dr. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, and then the guy who was left up in the capsule, Michael Collins. This video clip will give you, if you never saw it, if you're too young to remember Apollo 11, it's a little summary clip about the entire mission from launch Till splashing in the Pacific Ocean. So let's take a look at that clip now. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Shadow. Four forward, forward drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward drift. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn We're pretty busy for <laughs> Armstrong is on the moon. Captain Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. On this July 20th, 1969. That's one small step for man. Apollo 11, 
or welcome back. Now, of course, we can't talk about the moon without talking about some of the most prominent features on the moon. And we're going to talk about craters. Now, for a long time, people theorized that the craters on the moon were formed by volcanism, that they were great volcanoes that exploded, sort of like the Krakatoa back in the 1880s in uh, Indonesia. But there was a, a geologist by the name of Gene Shoemaker who theorized they were caused by impacting bodies, which you saw in the video at the beginning, the evolution of the moon. So the first one we'll talk to is Copernicus, named after Nikolai Copernicus. It's located in the, uh, the temperate region of the moon, the northern hemisphere. And we're going to go ahead and switch here to a close-up crater. And you can see here, close above Copernicus, you'll see how the walls of the crater have slowly slid in down. The crater is not a freshman, it's an old one, because the walls have slowly crumbled down toward the surface. You can also see in this image the central peak. And that is a, uh, a feature of craters on the moon, that when the impacting body happened, there was a slight bulge from the center which formed these, uh, these central mountain peaks. Now, we're going to go back to Don here, and we're going to take you down to the southern hemisphere of the moon, down here to the crater Tycho. Now, Tycho is named after Tycho Brahe. In America, we call him Tycho. <coughs> and he was the last of the great naked eye astronomers. He didn't have telescopes. And uh, he made exacting observations that Johannes Kepler used to calculate how bodies go around the solar system. Now, if we'll go back to the, the far away picture of Tycho, you'll take a look at the image and you'll see here these strange looking white rays shooting in all directions. Basically, the impacting body came straight down onto the surface of the moon and the material where the crater is now was ejected in all different directions, leaving these rays all around it. It's very easy to see, especially during the time of the full moon. In July, that will be on the 3rd. Um, you'll be able to see it very, very clearly. Now, we're going to zoom in, and we're going to show you a close-up Tycho. Again, you can see how the walls, this is a rather old crater, the walls have slowly slid down toward the bottom. And again, you can see a central peak. Now, on top of the central peak is a rather large hunk of rock, a boulder. To give you an idea on the scale, the little tiny boulder sitting on the central peak of Tycho Crater is as large as Co-America Park, a major baseball stadium. So this is a rather large rock. Now, what I'd like to do at this point is to give you a little more uh, interesting view of the moon supplied by NASA's mission, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this will give you a narrated tour of the moon, including Chakravon Crater and the South Polar Region. So let's go and take a look at that and enjoy the tour. The moon appears to be a sterile, gray, unchanging world. But while the moon has remained largely unchanged during human history, our own understanding of it has evolved dramatically. Thanks to new observations, we now have not only unprecedented views of its surface, but a whole new tour of the moon that shows how both it and other rocky planets in our solar system have been shaped over billions of years. We'll start with one of the largest impacts, Oriental Basin, a feature that's as wide as the distance from New York City to Cincinnati. Using new elevation measurements, we can clearly see the effects of what is likely the last giant impact event in lunar history, with its outer mountain rings rising many kilometers above the lowest points inside the crater. The interiors of some craters in the moon's polar regions, like Shackleton, haven't seen sunlight in over two billion years. However, new measurements have created our best yet maps of these types of craters, allowing us to see deep into the shadows of this surprisingly young looking impact crater in the south that's more than twice as deep as the Grand Canyon. Some impacts are invisible for other reasons. Although the ancient South Pole Aitken Basin is difficult to see from orbit because it is so large, New LRO topography maps reveal the largest impact basin in the Earth-Moon system, measuring several kilometers in depth and around 2,500 kilometers in diameter. Only the Hellas Basin on Mars rivals it in size. One of the youngest large-scale impacts on the Moon is the Tycho Crater. This fresh crater may have formed only 108 million years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. We now also have an extreme close-up view of the crater's central peak, revealing a mountain with sharp edges, building-sized rocks, and a central boulder about the size of a baseball stadium. 
The Aristarchus Plateau is another recent lunar formation that has long interested scientists and astronomers. The crater itself, formed in the same era as the Tycho Crater, and what appear to be Snaking River Valleys, were actually carved by ancient lava flows. Next, we arrive at Mare Serenitatis on the near side of the moon. In December of 1972, the crew of Apollo 17 landed in the Taurus Litro Valley, marking the last time humans have visited the surface of the moon. With images from LRO's narrow angle camera, we can clearly see the evidence of that visit. In this image, you can easily see the base of the lunar lander, along with the lunar rover, parked far from the blastoff zone. You can also clearly see the astronaut trails and the wheel tracks left on the lunar surface. We now head to the far side of the moon, which cannot be seen from Earth. Our first stop is the compton belkovich region, which shows evidence for young volcanic activity in the far side highlands. This feature is unique not only because it is isolated from other volcanoes in the area, but also because it is located nowhere near the Maria, where volcanoes are usually found. Also, on the far side, we find the Jackson Crater, which, like the Tycho Crater on the near side, has an extensive and complex ray system. In fact, this crater is often considered to be like a twin to Tycho. Finally, the Solkovsky Crater stands out as an excellent example of a far side crater filled with a sea of ancient lava, known as a mare. It is particularly interesting to scientists and other observers because of its isolation from other similar craters, as well as its beautiful central peak. As we continue to study the moon, our understanding of it improves, giving us new insights not only into how it has evolved over time, but also how other rocky planets in our solar system have come to look the way they do. With new missions, new instruments, and new technologies, we will continue to improve our knowledge of the moon and better understand the history of our solar system. Welcome back. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about so far is the movement of the moon, how it moves in the sky. We talked about the phases, but the moon does more than just orbit around the Earth. You see, the moon's orbit is elliptical. It's a little closer sometimes in its orbit, and other times it's a little farther away. And because of that shifting orbit and shifting position in the sky, if you were to watch the moon consistently for a long while, you would notice it actually, you know, you know rock and rolls. So we're going to show you this little clip, which is a portion of a moon in a year. We'll play that for you now and come back and uh, wrap up. John, this has been a fascinating look at the Earth's moon. Any closing comments? Sure. If people like to learn more about what's going on with the moon, they can check out the uh, NASA website for the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Uh, it has pictures. It has videos. It's a great site to check out. And join an astronomy club and begin to learn about our nearest neighbor in space because there's a lot of things to look at. Sounds great. Now, uh, if you'd uh, like to learn more, please go to our own website. You can see the web address down there at the bottom of your screen. And right after this scroll of upcoming astronomy events here in southeast Michigan, we'll be back with What's Up in the Night Sky.
Welcome to What's Up in the Night Sky for July 2012. Now, July typically is a very difficult month for astronomers because the sun rises so early and it sets very light. It doesn't get dark till 10.30 to 11 o'clock at night. So you only really get about five hours of real darkness. So if you're going to get out there and enjoy the night sky, be sure to get your nap in the afternoon before you go out and spend a few hours out there with the, uh, with the night sky. We'll start with the, uh, the moon and its phases. Uh, July starts with a full moon on the 3rd of July, just before all the fireworks take off. Uh, we then follow about a week later with the last quarter of the moon. And as the moon moves closer and closer to the sun, we'll have a new moon on the 19th of July. There'll be no moon in the sky, and if there's clear skies, you'll be able to see a lot of dark sky objects. And we'll finish the month with the first quarter moon on July the 26th. Now, as far as planets are in the sky, we'll go ahead and start with the red planet Mars. It has been up in the sky since winter time. It is now over in the western sky underneath the bright star De Nebula, the tail star of Leo the Lion. Now, as Mars continues its orbit around the sun, you're going to see Mars join the ring planet Saturn and the moon and the bright blue star Spica all together in the southern sky. This will be towards the end of July. But you can keep an eye on Mars and Saturn and watch the two grow closer and closer together as we see them from here on the Earth. Now we move on to the early morning sky before 5 a.m. where you'll see two bright planets and a really nice red star. Jupiter, the king of the planets, and then Venus, the brightest planet in our nighttime sky. And just below Venus, you'll see Aldebaran, which is the bright red eye in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. Now, Mercury is going to be very, very difficult to see. It'll be in the bright light of sunrise, just before the sun comes up. I'm afraid that our best view happened earlier in the year. Now, for our deep sky challenge, we're going to ask you to look toward the southern sky in July and find the globular star cluster Messier 22. It is near the constellations of Scorpius the Scorpion and Sagittarius the Archer. And here, we're going to give you a close-up. This is what you'll see through the eyepiece. Hundreds of thousands of stars glowing brightly together in our summertime Milky Way. And that's what's up in the night sky for July 2012. Before you go out in the field, be sure to prepare yourself with some mosquito repellent so they don't carry you off in the forest. And please enjoy the nighttime sky. It's there for everybody to enjoy.